people. The, when it comes to knowledge in Egypt, it, I don't personally think it can be beaten. Mm. If infrastructure is your thing and stability and be able to get things done and quality of life is your thing, then Malaysia whoo, pips Egypt, leaves it at the post standing. It depends what you're looking for. Mm. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I think it would be wrong for me, in fact, to recommend this country over that country, over that country, over that country, because my experience, based upon what my journey has been up until present day, is going to be different from somebody else who's never left the shores of the UK, for example. So, Assalamu Alaikum and welcome all to another episode of the Optimized Muslim Podcast. Today is another one of the interview series and Alhamdulillah, I'm very happy to be joined by uh, Brother Omar and Brother Hamza, uh, both from MakeHijra.com. Um, Assalamu Alaikum, brothers. Wa Alaikum Salaam wa Rahmatullah wa Barakatuh. Thanks for having us, bro. Jazakallah. Um, very happy to have you. And so I was going to say, I'll direct everyone to your YouTube channel because in this interview we're probably only going to be able to touch on a few of the questions that I have and there's a, a lot more content on there. I've been following it for about, I'd say, potentially over six months now. Um, oh, I've learned a lot and so I definitely recommend that as a resource for people to check out. Um, you've also got a website, makehijra.com. Um, so like I said, this podcast for me usually follows my own interest um, in terms of um, Alhamdulillah, it's a blessing that I can use this podcast to like pick your brains. Like I just watched the content. I liked what I saw and I thought, you know what, it'd be good to speak to you. And also um, other people will likely have some of the same questions as well. Um, so inshallah, it can be a means of benefit to everyone. Um, so to start off with, um, I just wanted to start with um your stories uh, like a brief overview of um how you first got into the journey of making hijra um setting your intentions and where that led you um and where you are now like kind of just a brief overview of that or go into however much detail you feel um is required so i'll start with um whoever wants to start inshallah <laughs> Uh, I think Ham, uh, Omar is the more talkative as the two of us. So I think yeah. first. <laughs> right. Right. Uh, the short story is that um, I became Muslim in uh, 1994, and uh, uh, I really, you know, going to the the mosque, I didn't really understand what was going on. And I became Muslim in Ramadan at the same time. So I, I went to Tarawiyah in these days and I didn't understand what was going on. So uh, just my natural uh, inclination is to understand what's going on, understand the, the language that's being spoken. So from that point, I, I wanted to go overseas and study. And uh, so that kind of kicked off my journey. Uh, originally, I wanted to go to uh, Medina University when I was I was still in high school when I accepted Islam, like in my senior year of high school. So I wanted to go ahead and go to uh, Medina University. That didn't work out. So uh, I, I was I stayed in the States for maybe four years, five years after that. I went to trade school and other stuff. And then I got married. And um, after I got married, I had two children. And at that stage, I felt that it was time to just go anywhere I could to try to uh, learn Arabic. So uh, that led me to Cairo, Egypt. And that's really where my journey began. No, um, with me, um, I took my Shahada in 1990, between 1990 and 1991. Um, Alhamdulillah, uh, my, it was my younger brother by two years who actually introduced me to Islam. Um, I got involved with some brothers in an organization um, trying to bring other Muslims together. And um, during that period of time, I was able to travel, um, not to very many places, but one place in particular was I went to Sudan in 1994. And it wasn't, it, you know, even though I had experiences of meeting other, other Muslims from different parts of the world, the actual thought of 
picking up my bags and moving to another country didn't actually hit home until one day. I was just reading the Quran as you do, and I came across the ayat in the Quran that I must have read many times. And you know, the ayat is, that says basically, um, when the angels come to them in death and ask them, you know, why are you here? And I think it was just on that particular occasion, that verse, um, I don't think, in fact, I don't even think I was going through anything drastic in that particular time in life to actually wake me up to what that verse meant to me at the time. I just happened to read it that day. And uh, I thought, you know what? It's true. I don't want to be woken up here. I'm being asked by anybody, you know, what am I doing here? Because I don't, I'd have no reason. So that was my that was my initial um, uh, ignition, if you like, to to wake me up to the point. Okay, well, I I need to leave. Um, at the time, also, my younger brother was actually in Egypt. So um, me and my family at the time, you know, we were looking around different parts of mainly Europe. We've been to Ghana. Um, like I said, I've been to um, Sudan previously, but it wasn't until I went to go and visit my brother in Egypt that I decided, okay, well, you know, it's a Muslim environment. It, it, you know, it, to me, it ticked all the boxes. So I think it was at that point there that I decided, you know what, number one, once I read the verses, Hijra was the must. But when it came to finding somewhere where I could go, um, when I went to see my, my younger brother, brother Ismail I just I, you know my heart was set on was set on Egypt so that's where I started uh, my journey from probably 1996 97 something like that mashallah mm, jazakallah khair for that so you both are veterans of the uh, the hijra kind of journey right I think yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> you both are like uh, ex- started in the 90s so i wanted this to kind of um i wanted to try and apply it to myself but also people in a similar position to me um so because i would say there are some people increasingly they're starting to develop an interest in this mm-hmm. and it's more obviously more of the uh, practicing uh, folks let's say um because they're disillusioned or they're not happy with certain things in the west um i've heard one of the videos of brother omar when he was interviewing a, a european river and you were talking about how obviously raising kids there's issues that you can face and these new agendas and uh, schooling and all the rest of it right but i think it um it also depends on your individual circumstances uh, because let's say uh, brother hamza you're from the uk right um That's correct, yes yeah. are you from the midlands in the UK? london london oh london okay so i'm currently near birmingham right a town near birmingham and i used to work in, in the north um in bolton which is near manchester mm-hmm. and there i was thinking like there's very established muslim communities in terms of like gujarati muslims they're like there's a lot more people that go to the mosques and the masajid for prayers so i'm from pakistani background but even compared to like pakistani uh, muslims in the uk i would say there's certain like gujarati or somali communities they have a much more uh, practicing culture <clears throat> so it's it was a very it was quite eye opening for myself as well when i moved there because you see a lot more people with beards and niqabs walking around the street and i just got the feeling that like <clears throat> if i was to they're perhaps second or third generation Muslims. If I was to stop them and ask them about Hijra, they'd be like, we're fine. Like, you know what I mean? Like everything seems as though everything's Muslim culture friendly, right? Mm. But then I feel like, say if you're a river or you're somewhere in like more of a um, secluded area where there's less Muslims, it's definitely something that would kind of affect you more. So I was wondering, just I know that's not really like a precise question, but any thoughts just on that? Yeah, I mean, I I think um, even back in my day, uh, when we talk about the late 90s, um, like you mentioned, the communities, the Somali community, the Pakistani community, the Bengali community, even to some extent, the African community, we all lived in our own little bubbles. So so the only time we actually left the bubble was to travel from our homes to the masjid or from our homes to work or from our homes to drop our kids to school. But usually we, we were able to surround ourselves 
with people that who are like-minded that we were able to blank out or walk around with blinkers about you know concerning things that were going on around us i think as time is getting faster things are happening more quickly that bubble is being burst i mean i think i had, I had a conversation with omar the other day i think we actually taped it where we found that or what we noticed it's like, for example, the Asian community, Bengali community, very, very tight knit, yeah? And you found that their children were the ones that were stu more studious in school. They were the ones that were more likely to um, go on to university and become doctors, become dentists, become whatever they wanted to be. And it was us left in the hood, if you like, and we just stood on life as, as, it was, as it was given to us. But I think those lines have now become blurred. And it's become blurred now because that bubble that we was in has burst, you know? And I think it's, it's our parents or people my age or Omar's age that have actually seen, we've actually witnessed that bubble burst, you know? And, you know, we, we spend less, t less time with our children, you know? Um, I mean, it, was, it, it wasn't unusual for us to know the uncle Every Salah time, every Fajr time, he was always there. But we don't know what he had to go through to be actually, to be able to establish himself, to be able to go to the masjid for every single prayer. You know, he was the Ma'avin, he was this, he was that. Now, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. It's, so I think that bubble that we were able to live in back then, or that security net back then, quickly disintegrated before our eyes and we're basically playing catch up now some of us are saying well, okay well i've been here for so long this is all i know so this is where i'm gonna stay and some of us are saying nah up until this point here i've got through by the skin of my teeth i've got through but now i have children and grandchildren that i have to consider so that's what's that's like what you mentioned before like you know the awakening if you like that's what it is, because like you were saying in Birmingham, I know Birmingham and Manchester pretty well, and it's a very, it's very heavily populated with, with, with Bengali and Pakistani um, communities, but they're very tight-knit. Everybody does business with everybody, everybody intermarries with everybody else, and nothing seems to exist outside of that bubble. But for their children and their children's children, it's a whole new world. <laughs> it's, a, it's a whole new world. So, you know, because I'm more at Jack, my children and my grandchildren are going to be okay. So I think that's why the question has now, you know, the question has now raised its head. I personally think to make it more, yeah. make it more a poignant subject. Yeah. You know, yeah. I've survived, but my kids might not. Brother you know Omar, I mean? uh, do you have anything to? Um, I always say that um, this topic is. Uh, you can't just paint it with a broad brush. It's something mm -hmm. that uh, every individual has to um, actually has to look into and see where they fit in this in this um, in this Hijra concept. Because every situation is different, every community is different. But there is a difference between a Muslim community and a Muslim country. You have to you have to know that. So you can be isolated in a few blocks. Or we have Muslims there and the masjid there, but it's a lot different than living in a country where the majority of the population is Muslim, and that's even from that goes from the government down. You know, even the guys that are corrupt or whatever, corrupt government officials or what have you, they're Muslims. Then they consider themselves Muslim, most of them, you know, and uh, and that was a, a much different experience living in Muslim countries and then living in Muslim communities. And then another thing is that. Um, by being there, in my opinion, we strengthen their ranks. Mm -hmm. we, we give them more power by living amongst them. And whenever they decide to do something to the Muslim countries or the Muslim, uh, the Muslim Ummah, then we're with them paying the taxes and sometimes joining the armies and everything else, you know, to go and fight against your Muslim brothers and, and other countries. That's, that's how I see it. So, if anything goes down, I'd rather be on this side of the world than that side of the world. Mm -hmm. Not to mention um, certain, so, see, I can't speak for UK, but definitely in the US, 
um, certain policies trickle down, like the the whole this whole concept of uh, LGBTQ and all these different things, all these uh, these different policies are becoming like educational policy. Like it's in school, like you send your kids. <clears throat> so when you send your children to school, they have to partake in these these discussions. And a lot of times we're not aware of what's going on because we're not there. And we only find out when something hits the news or your, your, your child comes home with a book that says my two moms or whatever. So not only that, it's not only that, it's also the influence. Uh, I guess you can isolate yourself. Again, I haven't been to, to UK, I don't know. I, I mean, to Birmingham and these places, I have no idea. But in the States, it's a little different. Like you, your, your community might be a few blocks. And once you leave those few blocks, now you're in the, in the reality of what's going on in America, you know, mm. so. Yeah, um, because I was thinking of when I was doing this podcast, um, I myself am interested in this topic, but then I was thinking about the audience and like other people like myself, say from like the Asian subcontinent kind of community and how it would apply to them. And then that's the kind of conclusion I reached that ultimately, something there has to be pain to push someone out right they have to feel like um there's something that they want to they want to kind of fight against or something that pushes them gives them that motivation whereas i feel like the whole the make hijra concept for people who are living in relatively tight-knit communities where they feel as though they can practice islam freely right even if some policy comes in from schools that like 90 percent of the schools muslim asian the teachers ain't going to teach any of that because like they'll have people marching outside and stuff so for some communities they have it like that and then i was also thinking like when our fathers first came here like 1970s 19 end of 1960s they all had the mindset of going back like just make hijra back no one thought they're going to stay here and they all thought, you know, they would never have thought in 50 years there's going to be mosques on each corner in Birmingham, let's say. It was a complete surprise for them. But I feel like they had a different identity, whereas their kids, they, some of them have sought out a new identity of like, I'm a Muslim, right? So they're going to put their foot down when it comes to like practicing Islam. Um, they have more of a zeal for it, let's say. Um, so they're more into practicing Islam. And I know now, <clears throat> excuse me, with it's, it's easier to be more flexible in terms of where you're living, working because of the Internet. So more people are deciding to optimize their situation, essentially. Like if you can work from anywhere, why not try and make things better for yourself and your family by moving to a Muslim country? You can't really deny the benefits. Um, so I just that's kind of the frame from which I was thinking of the interview and I'll move more into specific questions about the actual process of making hijra and whatnot um, unless you've got anything to add uh, to that. No, no, I mean, I mean, like you said, it's, you know, that's, that is it. It's a, I personally think is a full sense of security to think that basically, OK, you know, I can, you know, my, where I work, they allow me to pray. They give me an extra extra hour to go and pray to Allah. Um, you know, my local community is supportive of me. That is a that personally speaking is a false sense of security because again, you're okay. But you know, as Omar mentioned, it, it the, the your whole your whole bubble collapses when your son comes home and asks why he can't wear a hijab. <laughs> <laughs> it only takes it only takes one little question, you know what I mean? Or he asks he or she asks a questions about the birds and the bees that you think like because mm -hmm. if you if you break it down, you know how many hours a day do you actually get to spend with your child? You know, just because you or I have made it through, we can't or we shouldn't make a blanket assumption that because oh, I'm okay, my wife and my children are going to be okay. Yeah. yeah, and you know, even though Allah has given us the provision to have a, to attain a good life here, to, to attain a good life, it's like we, we, it's, it's permissible for us to attain a good life, yeah. Right? But that's a value judgment, bro. You know what I mean? Because I can go to work, because I can pay the bills, because I can do this, because I can do that. Allah's blessed me with a good life. Okay, well, everybody jump on board of the bandwagon. But okay, well. What about my wife? What about my children? What about my grandchildren? You know what I mean? 
just because I've managed to get through doesn't mean that they're going to get through. You know, and the ayat says, you know, save yourself and your family. You know, so be feeling safe because when you could, like in places like where we are, whether you're in the States or the United Kingdom, yeah, feeling safe is one thing. Actually being safe, it's, it's all right, that's, you know, I don't want to go off in a tangent here, but like, you know, actually feeling safe and being safe is two different things, man. It's two mm. different things. So I think, you know, that's what, that's to me, and I think, you know, to some extent, Omar, that's what makes Hydra um, more relevant, more relevant, because we've we've been given a way out. I didn't say, well, say it's going to be easy, but there is a route that you can take, you know? Mm. And it, I just think, I think it's, it's the relationship between the individual and their Lord that's going to help them make the decision as to, okay, I know the journey is going to be difficult, but you know what, Allah, I know you got my back. And we're going to go for it. Mm. And I, I don't think, sorry, one last thing. I don't want to go yeah, on. So, yeah. you can, the, the, community, the community itself is a means to help the individual. A community where we are, they, they can only do so much. They can only do so much. That's all I'm saying. So sometimes it's, it's a difficult decision or it seems like a difficult decision, but sometimes you just got to turn your back on the community and say, I'm out. Thank you very much for what you've done for me and my family so far. But you've helped me to, to this point. Now I'm out. Mm. <laughs> Shukran, but I'm out. Because you, yeah. can't, because you can only do so much as a community. Mm. You know? Yeah. That's a very... kind. Of, I, I hadn't thought of it from that angle in, in that, um, essentially, I think it's like the uh, Hadith goes that we're shepherds, right? And you have to guard or... Um, you have to do the terbiyah of like your flock essentially yeah. but so maybe we're thinking from the individualistic paradigm that obviously we're brought up in in the west right not mm. community or not long term centred because even if you take it at the community level and say okay we're alright now mm -hmm. you can't really how secure is that going forward it exactly. only takes it only takes a few policies to cause massive change right so yeah that's that's kind of a good way of thinking about it that essentially we have as muslims we need to be more community focused in terms of thinking of our next generations and of more course, everybody was happily holding hands and saying ring a ring of roses until 9 11. yeah it only takes one it only takes one incident and then how the rest of society views you now becomes apparent so you can either take stock of that or not yeah. You know I mean? Nobody expected 9-11, did they? Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? But then this, the finger pointing started happening and this started happening and that started happening. And you think to myself, hold on a minute, John. You've been my neighbour for all this time. You know my dad. This, that, now, I'm a, now I've got a beard. You're looking at me funny. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody expected 9 You know what I mean? And, and, it, and it basically, it rocks the foundation. Well, I thought, okay, well, I thought I was all right here. But some dude that I don't know flew a plane into a building just because he looks like me and talks like me you know looking at me different mm. you know what i mean mm. okay um so now moving on to more of the specifics of like making hijra um i was gonna ask you i had this question in my mind and that was that um perhaps it should come at a later stage but that was i was listening to something recently where they said like for people who are trying to sell something online, online courses and whatnot, right? Or education, basically. Um, they were saying like, give the education for free, sell the implementation. And I was thinking with Make Hijra, I feel like there's definitely something there. Like, have you got it in your plans to have something where you sell like the implementation? Like you basically, you get a brother who's interested and he's willing to invest and you give them the full kind of step-by-step -step of like, let's say they want to move to a country that one of you brothers are already in, you mm -hmm. give them like a guided process. Because I feel like that's something people would be interested in. Like even myself, let's say like, uh, instead of trying to figure it all out yourself, that's potentially like a service that you would be interested in. Have you, have you got any thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, yeah, we do, actually. Uh, <laughs> I actually but, thought he was going to say, no, man, feasibly left. No, I mean, we, we, put out, <laughs> we put out the information. We put out the information um, 
for free, obviously. And uh, yeah. we don't monetize the channel or anything. Um, but recently, we, recently we've discussed um, going to countries and doing uh, in-depth um, A to Z about the country, how to get in, how to stay, education, healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, actually going on the ground and talking to people there, talking to lawyers, talking to educators, talking to, and uh, packaging that up and, uh, and then offering that for a fee, you know, because it costs money to produce it. Mm -hmm. So we're thinking about doing something like that. We haven't announced it yet. But um, I think that it needs to go beyond just how much is the rent, how much is this, you know, the, these things, and get right down to business, like, and then also establish different connections that people can go to, trusted connections that uh, can actually pick you up from the airport and, and take you to wherever you need to go, kind of hold your hand until you're able to walk on your own. So this is definitely something that we're discussing. We just need to figure out how to um, how to launch it, you know. Because it's going to take it's going to take some capital to even, you know, to go there, stay in the hotels, and go around and you know film it and everything else. And we try to you know try to also create some type of manual, like a travel guide, that's updated yearly to reflect the new policies and new regulations and new prices and you know all that type of stuff. So yeah, definitely we're looking at doing something like that. Mm. So, Inshallah. Okay, so in terms of um, your experience with, I know you've lived in various different countries um, throughout your time on the Hijrah journey. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you say in terms of the main countries that you've been to? Um, what would you say are like the the positive things of the Hijrah journey that you didn't expect, and also the negative things of the Hijrah journey? that you didn't expect? <laughs> wow, okay. good question. Um, the positives. I suppose the positives is understanding that even though these Muslim countries are different culturally, they're basically the same religiously. You know, like, you know, the way they do things is based upon Shafi, Maliki, whatever but and and, it, and it's and a lot i suppose a lot of time you can actually see their maliki or shafi influences in society but that's as far as it goes that's their only difference it's still islamic mm. yeah um you know there are to to a lot of brothers amongst us you know a lot of us can be a, a little bit dogmatic um, because they obviously, depending on which part of the world you are, you find that a lot of cultural <coughs> cultural influences seep into the practices. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing, you know. There's not blatantly shirk or anything like that. But you know, we seem a lot. Of, a lot of us forget that um, when Islam came into the Arabian Peninsula, it 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 took on a lot of Arabian cultures, but just fine tuned them and made them halal. It's a, it's the same as when you go when you travel around the Muslim world, um, you see their cultural influences. Um, but it's you know it's it's you know that's well you know you know that that practice there is not something that's specifically Islamic. It's a practice adopted by Islam and it's it's okay. But no, no matter where you went, you go around the Muslim world, even though these differences are there, what unifies them is that they're all is they're all Muslims. They're all Islamic. Um, the one of the negatives is how difficult the Muslim world um, makes it for Muslims to be able to reside there. That's one of the things that is kind of um, heartbreaking because obviously you can't, you, you know, you're on this journey, you have an ideal picture. Well, yeah. Salam alaikum, bro. I'm, I've arrived. You know what I mean? And it's like, yeah, where's your visa, bro? You've only got 90 days. Okay. <laughs> as cold as that, bro. You know what I mean? Like, I've arrived. Yeah, okay, sir. You got your visa? Stamp, stamp. See you in 90 days. Mm. 
you know, and um, I think Omar mentioned um, in a couple of videos ago that, you know, it would be nice if we could call or create some type of international lobby where we could approach people in government and say, look, we have Muslims in the West who have the money. We don't need to depend on your economy. We'll just pay a yearly amount to be able to stay in your country, which is all we want. You know what I'm saying? And I think that, you know, when Omar and I were discussing it, you know, like Omar said, he doesn't think that they, they've probably looked at it from that angle. And my argument was they probably have, bro, but, you know, the powers that be probably say, no, 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 you can only have a certain quota per year. Because, like, uh, Egypt, and I always say about Egypt, Egypt is the wife that you, you love her, but you just have to divorce her. And then when you divorce her, you think, have I actually done the right thing? That's the relationship we have with Egypt. But Egypt is that is 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 a is the ideal place where such a policy would help the economy. Do you know what I mean? It will be able to give the powers that be the, the ability to monitor us so we're not doing any funky stuff. Do you know what I'm saying? Just charge us a yearly amount to be in your country as long as we're studying. We can't, we can't gain employment, so whether we make money online or whether we have a source of funds coming back from our countries of origin or in the West, that's what we want. We just don't want to be able to have, we pay, I don't know, $100 per person or per family or whatever. We get it stamped and we can stay as long as we like. That would boost the economy of a country like Egypt <coughs> or any, other, any, any type of Muslim country. We just, don't, we just want the ability to be able to stay there for long periods of time. We don't need anything from your economy. We just want to have, to have the ability to stay. So to me, that's one of the things that is not depressing, but it's like, oh, again? Do you understand what I'm saying? It's like, mm. so that's okay. with me, bro. So, Brother Omar, um, Brother Hamza says the positive is obviously like the umbrella of like the Brotherhood of Islam, essentially, wherever you go, um, despite s some differences that might be fiki or whatever else. And the negative about the difficulties imposed by different states on people gaining citizenship. So what would you, what about from your perspective in addition to those? In addition, um... What well, positive is for family people, people with families, I would say, to be able to uh, raise your family the way that you want to raise it without any intervention from, from uh, government or any place like that. And I say that because uh, in the States, if I said to my daughter, you have to wear this hijab, she can call social services and tell them that I'm forcing her to do something she doesn't want to do. And then the government can intervene and come to your house and take your children from your house. That can happen in the States. I'm not sure about the UK, but in the States, definitely. Mm -hmm. Somebody can, somebody can, a neighbor can call social services and say, I saw him push his son, or I saw him, uh, I heard his son screaming or something. And then the social services will come. And based on whatever you say, if they can look around your house, or they see that you have, 10 kids in a three bedroom house, they could take your children. And uh, that, <clears throat> that happened early on when we had our third child, the doctor sent the social service to our house to check the conditions of the house. So all she had to say is that, uh, we don't think this is a fit place for these children. And then they come take your children away. You know? So uh, even if you, if you wanna say like, you just want them to be uh, Islamic, so you kind of like, uh, put them in different environments that you think are the best envir environments for them. So they seem kind of like they're sheltered off. So now you have people looking and seeing what's going on. Like, why are these kids in the house? What's going on in the house? And they might catch a child outside and start talking to them and trying to figure out what's going on. It's, it's like that. That's the situation um, it, it, in the States, especially. And a lot of brothers that I know have had problems, you know, with this. So I would say in the Muslim world, people don't, they, they don't enter your business that way. Mm. I mean, they would say something, if you're in the street and you're, you're beating a child, they might come to you and say, yes, yeah, Shay, you know, you know, have some mercy or something, you know, but they don't, it's the police and all those people, they don't get involved in that. So you're able to kind of like 
create the environment that you want in your home. And then outside, there's a match. Like if you're teaching your children how to pray and you say, okay, you pray five times a day and this type of, and you're teaching these basic concepts, you're going to hear the event five times a day. It's going to match. Mm-hmm. So if you're, if you're telling your children, look, you, you know, if you want, if you have a uh, desire for the opposite sex, you have to get married. But in order to get married, you need this, this, that. When they walk out, they see families. Mm-hmm. They see, you know, husbands and wives. It's not a place you're going to go where you see, I mean, you'll see boyfriend, girlfriend, but you won't know what it is, really. You know, unlike the states where it's like even the girls are trying to talk to you and trying to, you know, and it, it wasn't like that when I was growing up. It was kind of like, you know, you had the men made the move and the women, you know, but now it's the opposite. It's like the women are making the moves on the men in the States. So anyway, that's a positive in, in, from my perspective or from my, my opinion is that you could bring your family there, immerse them in the environment and then mold, mold them at home to, and then see what you're teaching them implemented in society. That's not to say that there's no, uh, no vices or anything or crime or anything. I'm not saying that, but generally speaking, what you see out in the open are those things that you're teaching in your home. Negative, I have to just build off what Brother Hamza said, is that you have to be concerned with being legal wherever you are. And that's for, uh, that's for mainly converts because we don't have a place to go back to. Like we don't have a Muslim country that our mothers and fathers came from. So we have to go and we have to go to Pakistan and just, you know, get in with in, in the Pakistan. And hopefully <laughs> they'll accept us in Pakistan. I'm but, going with our deal. When you go, I'm yeah. coming with you, bro. <laughs> right, yeah. you know, so you actually, the brothers, like if, I'm telling you, like if I had some roots in Pakistan, it'd be a whole different thing. Mm. Like I, I wonder, I asked brothers, I asked, I have, brothers I know from Pakistan, and I just ask them, I'm asking them, like some of them are in Turkey. And I'm like, what's wrong with Pakistan? You know, I don't know. So it's just a, it's a genuine question. Like I will go back to Pakistan, like with what I've learned or what I've gained from whatever I, reason I went to the West, I go back to Pakistan and I build that. Like those are my people. Mm, yeah, you know, so I, I would I would do my best in that country. Like I bring all my resources to there. Like instead of buying these expensive homes in the UK, I go over there and build like three or four homes. Mm. I'll go over there and help the poor people teach them. Let me yeah. educate you. Let me build some educational uh, facilities and and make it what the best things that I've learned from the West. You know, and even I can bring that money from the West. Yeah, right? exactly. it's some people that are in Pakistan. It's people that are in UK businessmen and all that, I have run that business in the UK and funnel that money right back to Pakistan. Yep. That's that's what I would do. I'd enrich my, my country. Yeah. yeah. My people. I would do that. So again, that's that's a negative, like trying to find a place like we're constantly like for a man, you try not to put it on your women, like you know, the, the stress that you go through trying to make them legal in the country. Mm. Some some brothers don't care. Some brothers are just illegal, and that's just it's just that. Just like some of the people in the states are illegal, and they're just reaping the benefits from being there. But me personally, over the years, I've realized that the best best way to do it is the legal way because you'll end up in prison, uh, you'll end up getting kicked out, you end up breaking your family up. All this stuff is happening. So a person, you know, the negative most negative part is that they haven't it hasn't clicked with the with the Muslim governments in the right way as to how they can benefit from bringing, let, allowing people to come and live there. Because we actually, I spend all, all the money I bring into this country. I spend money from outside in. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm contributing. So that should mean something. Jazakallah mm-hmm. khair. Mm-hmm. So yeah, a, a couple of points that came to mind whilst I was listening. Um, one is the issues, I think um, once you have kids, which I don't at the moment, but I think the pain points build that you like you mentioning because even here in the UK, I'm sure Brother Hamza will be aware is that there was a, like a controversy about the prevent scheme, prevent movement, which is essentially like oh, don't get me started on that, bro. <laughs> <laughs> which is essentially like where even teachers are told to like say if they see uh, a six or seven year old um, say something that doesn't go within the speech corridor of like yeah. the West, right? They'll get yeah. reported. 
and they have like very weird rules as to what they deem radical. Like someone speaks highly of a beard or something, it'll yeah. be like, oh, that's questionable. You know, let's let's put a little tick mark there. Keep an eye on that little kid there. So it, there's issues like that that I feel are pervasive in the in the West definitely. Um, the second point was about. I agree with you in terms of Pakistan because um, recently I was there's a, a channel where a brother essentially moves back. Um, that's his situation was different because he's from Pakistan. He got married here, so they have more of a, like a stronger connection, I would say, than someone who's born here. But essentially, mm-hmm. the concept was the same. He managed to like sort everything out, the cargo, send it all back, and got a limited company set up for his employer, and starts working from there because he's like a um, software engineer or something. And then um, there's a brother, Abu Musa, I interviewed him two weeks ago. But here's where the difference comes in, because he was planning on making Hijrah to Pakistan. And then because there was like a sudden government change, like two months ago, where Imran Khan, who was the previous prime minister, suddenly got toppled by, he says, this Western conspiracy. Mm -hmm. That level of kind of political uncertainty affected his decision, where he's saying, you know what, now I've decided I'm going to Sharjah, right? So... Mm -hmm. They're the kind of factors, a lot of Pakistanis, even in the UK, they seem very patriotic when it comes to like Pakistan and all the rest of it. But then I think the the thing about contributing to Pakistan, the reason they're put off is because things like corruption, which is everywhere. But, you know, when they see it, they feel as though I don't want to be I don't want to be contributing to that. You know, what I mean, even though living in the West, you're contributing to it, just that it might be not as visible. You know, what I mean, you're still contributing to the system. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's nothing to do with us, bro. The, the, the thing is, this year, let's take the Pakistan situation for example. All right, the, it, the ordinary plebs in society, it has nothing to do with us, whether they overthrew Brother Khan or not, whether it was a conspiracy or not. It's not like, okay, they overthrew him on Monday and now there's a 25% drop in the amount of masjids in, in the country or there's no more Islamic education or there's no more Islamic environment there. There's, like, Islam hasn't been wiped off the face of Pakistan because they removed Imam Khan. Do you know what I'm saying? Because, the, like, you know, Allah says he's Lord of the world. The political world is a different world from you and I where we're just ordinary working class people trying to keep the lights on. I, like, does that does that country, whether it be Pakistan or anywhere else, does it provide an environment for me and my family? Does it make does it make our journey towards Allah easy or more difficult now that they've removed Imran Khan or not? If the answer is well, nothing's really changed on the ground, then let let the politicians do what they're doing, bro. As long as you don't touch the environment, as long as I can still, me and my family can still relax and breathe and sleep and eat Islam, tell us. Well, I'm going to add to that. I'm going to mm. add to that too. Please do. Uh, like, I, I understand how brothers feel about uh, people that are like apolitical. Mm. Like, they, like they, uh, or they may feel like you support the unjust rulers and that type of thing. But um, it's, it's something else to that. And I can tell you based on the fact that both Hamza and I were in Egypt during the revolution, mm. the the revolution and the counter revolution, both. No. Uh, I'm not sure if Hamza was in Malaysia during the elections, because I went to visit and I was I went there during the election when the government changed. So I could tell you firsthand. I could tell you firsthand that no matter how politically active you are, it really does not affect you. I, I know there's a hard pill to swallow, mm. but even even the revolution when the the police said, you know what, we out of here, they left, and the people just started policing themselves. We are in the street with the and gold blocks and doing all this. It, it was like you didn't feel anything. On that level, you don't feel anything. You know, you're in your community, and your your life goes on, day to day activities go on. Now it's hard for me to say that does it affect the the Egyptian citizen, and I will argue that I will argue that the general person is not really affected. It's not really affected by these things. It's like the, what we're doing day to day is not affected, you know, unless you're in uh, some type of political circles or you're connected to some part of the government or something like that. Maybe, 
But generally speaking, like when you go to these places, you just you you're just a regular person. You're coming in. You're trying to raise your family. You're trying to go to the mosque. You're trying to educate your children. You're trying to so those type of things really don't affect you. That's been my experience. Mm. But it, um, it's not to stop you from having a, a point of view. It's yeah, not yeah. to say that you know that that was unjust that they took this one out and put this one in. Mm. I feel personally like look look what happened because during the time when Morsi was in Egypt, it was like a different feeling in the air. Yeah, Every, everybody would say the same thing, right? Yeah, that's true. And then you found like the the preachers coming out and just letting it all out before they couldn't say much. <laughs> he was there. They were just they, they yeah, were most barred. You know, yeah. they could say whatever they wanted. So, yeah, people felt differently from that perspective. But generally speaking, man, the politics and you know, what the politicians do is something, it's always something deeper with that. And they know what it's about. And we really don't know. We don't yeah, know what don't know really will happen. Yeah. You know, we just hear it through the media outlets. We're not connected. Mm. So, anyway, that's, that's, that's my perspective on that, bro. Mm. I agree with you. Um, I was just saying, like, the perspective that, I follow like uh, different channels, even from Pakistan, like Urdu speaking business channels and whatnot. And th they say the same thing, like, but it's a small section of the population. He's basically like teaching people how to start up various businesses. And he's like, look, why do you care who's the prime minister? They're not going to save you. You know what I mean? Like focus, focus on yourself and your own business, on your own kind of community, family, things like that. But um, yeah, so I feel like coming from that kind of background, um, if if your father's born in Pakistan, you automatically get citizenship from Pakistan. Alhamdulillah. Um, <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So, so we're like dual nationals, but then the negative of that in the West is that you know in the West now they have that thing where they can take your if you if you've got a nationality somewhere else or even if you can get it, then they can um, strip you of your UK citizenship. Like if you you know contravene one of their um, rules, um, but Alhamdulillah um, still. So anyway, um, I think it's been about 50 minutes, so we'll have 10 more minutes if that's all right, inshallah. Why, man? Um, so in terms of, let's say you had a younger, I would I would say a son, but then with a son, it gets a bit different because arguably he's been brought up in the same household. So let's say you have like a nephew that you want to advise who asks you, look, I want to make hijrah. He's living living in a different country. How would you set him up with the best advice that you've got from your 20, 25 years of like um, this journey? Let's say he has enough to sustain himself in a Muslim country um, for about 12 months. Right. And yeah, let's say that as a like starting off point. What would your kind of initial pointers be? And let's say he doesn't really mind um, where he moves either. And he hasn't got citizenship in a country. So they're the kind of framework. How would you kind of tackle that question? Um, oh, but firstly, if he's got 12 months worth of money. Okay, um, six, six well, to 12 I mean, months. Even if it's six months, okay. I would say to invest that money and put it into something that he can country hop. Like, because just put it this way, the first country you go to, you know, you might, if you, I'm going, okay, I'm going, I'm going to, to, to Dubai. Yeah, and you make all the istikhara, you do all your research, you you know, you, you know how much money you're gonna need, you know exactly where you're gonna go to, you've made the contacts, all you have to do is arrive and everything is good. You might arrive and Allah might say, you know, I haven't chosen this place for you, so it's not gonna work out. So tie your camel, be able to be able be flexible enough to understand that where you think you you want to be might not be what's written down for you. You might want to go to Dubai and end up in Mali mm -hmm. because that's where that's where that's what's been written for you. So my thing would be set yourself up in a situation where you are able to country hop if necessary, which means having some means of income that can sustain you. And I, I did the figures the other day. Yeah, once you leave the equator. Once you jump that line, yeah, the amount that you need to survive on, I'm talking about rent, transportation, food, this, that, and the other, whatever, drastically diminishes once you once you cross that equator. If you were, if you want to exclude the Qatars and the Dubais and the, the you know the the, 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 um, 
the Arab Emirates, for example, exclude those places there, anywhere else in the world, if we compare what we need to live in the West and take, I would say, a, a third of that, you should be good, yeah? And do your homework. Like, be, be flexible enough to understand that where you want to go might not be where you end up. Knowing that's the case, have yourself in a situation or in a or in a, in a in a in a situation where you can open your laptop and do a couple of hours work per day and earn an income, and then go bismillah and then go brave. Because once you have your income, once you have an income and it's stable, sky's the limit. Okay, I'm going to be here for the next couple of years, knowing that if it doesn't work out, I can jump somewhere else. And if that doesn't work out, I can jump somewhere else. And if that doesn't work out, until you find something you think, you know what, okay, this seems to be all right. I'm going to be here. But even then, that might not work out. So the, mm. the, the most you important know, thing... You, I mean, with that, I, I just want to add to what Brother Hums is saying because mm. you have to realize that going from Qatar to UAE is like an hour to hour flight, maybe. Yeah. You know, it's not, it's not like coming from America to United States to... Egypt or something like that, like 14 hours, you know. So so to hop around is not really that big of a deal. It's and then on top of, of that, it's mm. not expensive. Mm. It's not expensive to hop to go around. And and like the brother said, like you should be open to exploring, you know, seeing seeing what, how do you can fit into those different situations before you decide. You shouldn't just go to one place and just say, oh, okay, yeah. Because it may not be for you. You know, and it could turn you completely off. Mm. You know, I, I, when you go to Egypt, if you're looking for like something, something pretty, you'd be disappointed for the most yeah. part. I yeah. mean, they have some areas there, but if you're looking, for, I mean, especially where we are, because a lot of Tulab Ulam and the people that's trying to learn Arabic and this type, they live rough. A lot of the brothers live rough, you know, and the areas are just, you know, some in some cases seem unlivable, you know, but you also have areas that are nice and but you but you have to jump you have to get in look around say okay this is not really something i want to do and then move be able to move to another place and and, and check that out and see if you're able to do it and then it may not you may not be able to get it on that first try mm. but that's six that's six to twelve months worth of money you may have, that might just be your uh what do you call it fact finding mission yeah and then you have to go back and then once you know where you want to be then you start saving for that uh, mm. for that place mm. and then it goes without saying but the positive of all that you know when like people are listening to this and like that sounds like a mission right the positive is it's your intention what you're doing it for because mm. you're getting rewarded inshallah for every step of the way so we have to view it from a, like with any good deed right let's say even spreading knowledge or good information whatever you have to see it from that perspective and it's even like neuroscience like um, if you see a struggle as being potentially rewarding it's much mm. easier for your brain to kind of accept it and not get um, like that damaging kind of stress it might be stressful but it's mm. like a good stress that builds you up mm. um, so yeah so okay um, just a side question uh, because I think I, I did see a video of you uh, in Malaysia I think that like you were trying out some food or something. And, uh, <laughs> Fridays. Yeah, that was good. But um, because with Malaysia, I feel like anybody who's met Malaysian people, right? And for us living in the UK, for me, it was like um, when I was at university, you meet Muslims, Indonesian, Malaysians, and everyone comes away with a good impression because they're very like in general, obviously exceptions everywhere. In general, they're very like smiley, bubbly, like friendly like assalamu alaikum you know how you were saying earlier that you get to a place and you're like Aslam. they're the Malaysians yeah. essentially right and they bring a smile to your face so uh, what, what's your experience in terms of not just the people but in terms of Malaysia as a potential destination what are your what's your takeaways nothing but positivity man mm. it's like it's <sighs> I can't even get the words out bro it's like there's like I'm, I'm thinking about okay how many negative things that happen to us out there. And I have to say, none. Like the, infra bro, like the infrastructure is on point. 
Like the 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 healthcare is on point. The, my daughter my daughter went there, went to play school for that on point. The, the the people have this customer service type of attitude. It's mm -hmm. on point. The streets are clean. It's on point. There, it's like I'm, like I don't want to hype up Malaysia. Like it is the place. It's per, it's the nearest to perfection that you're gonna get. You've but not been appointed the ambassador or something, have you? Yeah. Yeah, it's like I'm trying to sell it. You know what I mean? <laughs> but like, it, it, and I think in um, Omar and myself's experience there, when we compared it to where we were before. And then we felt oh, like, okay, like going down to the immigration and sorting out your visa. Mm -hmm. When you compare Malaysia to where we've just come from, oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? It's like, why can't they just do it like this? It's so much easier. You know what I mean? It's, it's, un it's un even the police out there, bro. I got stopped out there, me and my wife, Af two Africans in the car, I put the talking outside the car. A couple of police officers came over, heard our heard, asked to see our passports. I I went to get my passport, and he went, "You know what, sir? It's okay." Got in the car and left. <laughs> He's like, oh. yeah. "Do you know what I'm saying?" So then here's like, the oh, question: no, we're gonna, We've got a tug in in Malaysia. What are we gonna do now? Nah, I went to go in my pocket to get my passport, and he went, "You know what, sir? It's fine." Left. <laughs> But, so, but, but listen. here's the here's the question then why why what happened then how come you're not in malaysia or if you are or why did you not decide to stay is it the citizenship bro, thing? that 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 was that was between that's called the law bro like if if, if 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 we had that choice if we had that choice and I, I i can't speak for omar but i'm sure i've got this right if we had that choice i think we'd be in malaysia right now the choice of being able to stay in Malaysia was 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 unkindly taken away from us. But Kadir Allah Masha for like, you know what I'm saying, bro? If yeah, COVID, COVID killed it. Yeah, COVID killed it, bro. That's a good one. <laughs> COVID killed it because the COVID policy started it, to change. Yeah, the yeah, policy bro. started to change. We <clears throat> we ran into some some issues with the visa, and you couldn't fix it. Couldn't fix it. Couldn't fix it because of COVID. But Shay, yeah. even COVID, yeah. Everything shut down, right? So, like immigration, for example, we had to go online and uh, book an appointment block. Yeah. Now, usually, you go into a building, you make an appointment, you go into a building, you've got people, you you queue, you stand up, you go and see people, you get your thing done, and you go home. So now we're thinking, okay, now the country's on lockdown, we're gonna have to be standing at their queues and appointments being missed, <coughs> bro, within 24 hours. Yeah they had an online system that was on and popping for immigration there was a there was a ripple in the organization but it was done it was sorted like that like mm. that bro you know I, mean? like, I so, highly 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 recommend malaysia people might have some ideas about their funky beliefs and all that which in truth they're not <laughs> funky beliefs but just have they just have a different way of doing things bro do you know what i mean it's like for example after isha they all they all recite with the Imam Shrutul Muk. That's what they do. But there's a hadith that says, you know, those who read Shrutul Muk after <coughs> after Isha, you know, it protects you from the punishment of the grave. They choose to do it together. All right. So what's the big deal, yo? Like, little silly things like that. We don't have time for that. Mm. You know what I mean? But mm. other than that, bro, listen, man, Malaysia to me will always be in my heart, man. Egypt and Malaysia, are the two places. I compare everywhere to those two places. Jazakallah hmm. khair. Um, I know Brother Omar said you have to go um, after about an hour. So, um, yeah, Alhamdulillah, is very. I really enjoyed the uh, interview and the Thank advice you, that you that you gave. Um, inshallah, people benefit and they visit your YouTube channel definitely because I know the content, the quality has improved as well recently. And um, brother Hamza, I like your, um, you know that where you answer them questions. It's like very yeah, yeah. Your questions answered, yeah. Yeah, um, but yeah, Jazakallah Khairan. I learned a lot, and um, again, um, I appreciate the time that you gave both of you from different Welcome parts of the world. Too. And um, I pray that you get the best, inshallah, in the future. And Allah put barakah in your projects and Thanks all so the work much. that you do. 
And yeah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Mm. Brother Hamza, just continuing on the discussion, Brother Hamza has kindly um, agreed to stay on for a while longer, inshallah. So, yeah, so Brother Hamza, just building off uh, the last question about, mm. like, say, if you were advising someone on the whole hijra process, we mm. went on a bit of a we got carried away a bit with Malaysia, which yeah, was, you know. which was a surprise. I, I was surprised how uh, how much kind of you both. I saw that you, both of your faces lit up when I when I yeah. mentioned it. Which no. alhamdulillah, that's the testament to the place. Then I guess, and mm. there's someone else that actually I was following recently on social media, and he he was traveling through Turkey, and then he went from Turkey to Malaysia, mm-hmm. and he was saying the same things about like the negatives that he saw in Turkey, how there weren't any of them in Malaysia. Um, okay, so you were saying about be prepared to be flexible. Um, say if someone's got six, six to twelve months of um, room, let's say, um, in terms of finances, be flexible. You might not end up where you initially set out. Mm-hmm. Um, but let's say someone was like, you know what? Tell me a country that I should start off in. <laughs> um, I, it's, it, I think it depends on your temperament, bro. To be honest with you. Um, like, like for example, like when we, when we were when we were uh, recording for Malaysia, we couldn't even imagine or in in like anybody would have anything negative to say about Malaysia. But you'd be surprised. I mean, there wasn't a lot of comments, but like people were saying, "Oh, Malaysia is not an Islamic country because of this, 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 and Malaysia this and Malaysia that." So it's it's difficult for Omar or myself or anybody else really to say Gambia is the best place because this, 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 this. Turkey is the best place because of this, 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 this. Like, it depends what eases your heart. When you arrive there and, you, you know, you experience the people, you will know, man. You will know you think, yeah, this, yeah, this is all right. This is all right. We can recommend, I would recommend Egypt and I would recommend Malaysia all day long. Somebody might go to Egypt and think, you stayed here and recommended here. Because the, like the brother was saying, there are places in 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 um in Egypt where we said, especially Nasser City, where you think, but there's donkeys and dogs eating at the same rubbish pile. And there's and obviously in other places in Egypt where it's like, okay, this is heaven on earth, like almost. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? And the thing is, it's not like there's a great distance that separates the two worlds. Yeah. Mm. But what but the overall thing about Egypt is knowledge, you're able to push your hand out and just touch it. Mm. You know what I mean? Like if you want to learn your Islam privately, somebody coming to your home, you can do it. If you want to mm. travel to a school, you can do it. If you want to be a sheikh, you can be. You know, if you want to be a uh, um uh, uh you know. Half is Quran, you can be. The, 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 when it comes to knowledge in Egypt, it, I don't personally think it can be beaten. Mm. If infrastructure is your thing and stability and be able to get things done and quality of life is your thing, then Malaysia whoo, pips Egypt, leaves it at the post standing. It depends what you're looking for. Mm. So I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I think it would be wrong for me, in fact, to recommend this country over that country over that country over that country because my experience based upon what my journey has been up until present day is going to be different from somebody else who's never left the shores of the UK for example yeah so that's why I always say that 12 months worth of money that 12 months worth of money should be used as a fact finding mission money Mm. Or, or part of it should be used as a fact finding and the rest of it should be invested in some type of means of income that can sustain you while you end while you possibly could end up traveling the world for the rest of your life that's as like with my journey at the moment my family's in tanzania so what i've chosen to do because the the immigration situation for tanzania is is very very difficult so until we get that problem sorted i do three months in the uk and i do three months in tanzania so, and in the meantime, while I'm here working, I send money home and it's just, it's just being banked, 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 banked until I'm, until I'm able. So part of my income is to sustain my family. Another part of my income is to 
build something. I'm going to save up to get, whether it's going to be buy land, get into agriculture, buy property or something. But I might do all that, and I'm full aware of this, I might do that for the next five years, now be ready to move, and it flops. Mm. This, is the, this is the journey of Hijra. Mm. <laughs> you know, it's one of those things. And hopefully, inshallah, I'll be judged, judged based upon my intention. My intention is to leave here and go there. Yeah? What, where Allah decides to guide me or take me during that journey is up to him. Mm. I just hope that I get rewarded for the effort that I've made to please him. Khalas. Because that's what it's about at the end of the day, bro. Mm. MashaAllah. Yeah, that was a sick answer, you know. Because you're right, it's easy to give the generic advice, but that's a very nuanced answer. And it's true. Essentially, it, it, you're right. In terms of delineating between those who prefer, um, say, a young person who just wants to study, then mm. it might be because I think Medina to Nasser is where like they have the Arabic centers and, and yes, whatnot, exactly. isn't it? Yes, yeah. yes, yes. So they might be willing to like go through the trenches and just learn the but then there's someone else who's very um meticulous, they have that kind of conscientious personality where they're tidy and like you know how yeah. they are. So then for them, they'd be attracted by the infrastructure and things getting done on time and stuff like that that you might find in a different country. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely. Okay. Mm. Um another thing is I feel like I was thinking about this. I didn't get a chance to say it uh, at the beginning was that um you know I was talking about how you have different tight knit communities and whatnot um in the U. another factor is like say if you're a British Pakistani, right? Um unless because if you're a revert, you've suddenly mm. taken on this new identity. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're you've already made a massive life change because of your faith. So you're ready as in like if you have to go to a different country, like you're more prepared for that because you're kind of psychologically adjusted in that in that way. Okay. Um, a lot more. Uh, obviously, you um, you can disagree with me on this or like I'm just trying to throw it out. Mm -hmm. there. So so then this whole journey and idea of making Hijra. Um, it's not as far fetched because you've already changed a lot about your life completely, right? Made new mm -hmm. friends, left that whatever. So, and then I was thinking, whereas if you're a Muslim born here, it has it's very different because you get the the only an analogy that I can give is like, you know, um, if you grow up and you're in if you're a Muslim and you're in like a majority non-Muslim school, um, like let's say there's 2% Muslims, 98% non-Muslim. It can go one of two ways. Either you're slightly isolated and you retain your faith and culture somewhat and you're like, you know, in like year nine, year 10, when people start going out drinking and stuff, you're like the guy who doesn't do that. And yeah, you yeah. can't mix in 100%. But Alhamdulillah, you retain that kind of your, your dean and so The other way it can go is if you have less of a strong personality, you're just going to Get like, sucked in. <laughs> you're just gonna get sucked in and like mm. when you when like you go uni you ain't even gonna be a muslim like i remember meeting someone at university um sad story but like his father was the first one who entered our kind of shared living space with his mm -hmm. son and he was like where's the qibla like he was that on it, <laughs> right? no <laughs> he was that on it bengali uh bengali family and uh -huh. we were like, and he's the one that made sure his son gets to share with other Muslims. Uh -huh. After his dad went, I remember we were walking to the local Tesco and the, the guy was like, you know what, I don't even, he had like a Sussex accent. So he, knew, yeah. he was like, you know what, I don't even believe, I just do it for my father. And we were just like, I was like, like, and that's the, what happened there was the, he was part of the percent that like went to a white school. I say white, I mean like non-Muslim school because mm -hmm. they thought that was the better thing, take him out of the Asian community, right? He, and he just got sucked in. So, but anyway, the, bringing it back to the Hijra question was like, someone who's, say if you're born here and you're Muslim here, um, the throwback you have is that everyone else is Muslim and they're all here and they don't have an issue with it, right? Whereas mm -hmm. if you're if you're that kid in school and you see all the non-Muslims, the reason you don't go into all that is because you're like, I'm a Muslim. You, these are these are non-Muslims. You know what I mean? I have a different set of beliefs, and you can see that clear delineation. Whereas, say, if you're in a school where it's like um, majority Muslim or 50-50 you see all the other kids messing about and they're Muslim so that takes away your main kind of little thing that's holding you so in a way that can 
act for you as well. And with the Hijra thing, it's like when you're in a community full of Muslims and they're all like happy go lucky getting on here, it's very hard, unless it's a personal reason, it's very hard to get that community buy in, if you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, I do. I do. But the, the thing is, this it's like, it's like, like, okay, this, like, England is my town. I grew up here, influenced here. My children are born here. My parents, my family's here. I became Muslim. My family was accepting of me become Muslim. Um, you know, I had a very, very vibrant and open Muslim community that I was a part of. So the thought, the idea of actually, or the permissibility of being able to live here wasn't actually a thing until I just opened the Quran one day and I read that verse. And I think that kind of, that type of epiphany, I think it's, it's, it's possible because when I read that verse, I was like, okay, now I have to question, even though my life is as good as it is, because I wasn't going through any type of hardship or detrimental, like, you know, I wasn't depressed. I wasn't waking up in the morning and find myself sleeping on the roadside or anything like that. My life was all right. Mm. I just happened to open that Quran one day <coughs> and come across the ayah and the thought come into my mind for that split second, is it actually permissible for me to be here? And that, can, that type of epiphany can happen to anybody, whether you're born here, whether you're not born here, whether you, whether, you know, with what, no matter what your cultural heritage is or nothing. If, okay, if, you're, if your Islam is important to you, to anybody, you, that, that individual, come just reading that, just reading that ayat. The way you, the, when you open that book and that ayat jumps out at you or not jump out at you, dictates what your religion means to you. Do you know what I'm saying? I'd read that ayat many times before, and it, it hadn't just an ayat. Okay, I know why the ayats were revealed, blah, 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 blah. Okay, fine. Close the book, move on. On this particular day, read it, and the question came in my mind. Is it actually permissible for me, as a Muslim, to be here? How long were you Muslim at that stage? Cool. I was 19, well, became Muslim in 1990. I left England 2000, 2010, 2011. Okay. So you, okay. <clears throat> so you were Muslim for like 20 years before. Yeah. You... Mm. And everything was kushti. Everything was nice. No big drama. 9-11 was like a bump in the road. You know what I mean? <laughs> But it wasn't nothing to, and just, and then and the, and the, and it, it it begged the question. I said, so I started asking questions. I started reading, and the conclusion that I came to that, like Omar mentioned, that you know, it's it, everybody's it, every, it should be taken on a case by case situation. But to me, when I looked at my case, I'm thinking. Regardless of who I'm married to, regardless of my children, like, in my eyes, my Lord is looking down at me and saying, Hamza, it's not permissible for you to be here. Whoever wants to come along for the ride with you, ahlan wa sahlan, they're welcome. Which is what the attitude I had. Like, my, I, like, okay, do you want to come with me? Because according to this, I shouldn't be here. If you, if you want to come, you're welcome. Let's do this thing together. Yeah, but for me, I can't, I'm not allowed to. I can't be here. This is, I can't call this my home. It's where I live, but it's not my home. And that's mm -hmm. where my journey started. So, mm -hmm. with it, like yourself, like you were born Muslim, you have Muslim family, Muslim cultural background, etc., etc., etc. Just like it happened to me, bro, it can happen to you or people like us. You mm -hmm. just something that clicks and asks the question. Mm. You know what I mean? Forget about, okay, I'm living an all right life. You know what I mean? My family love me. I'm this, that. I'm massive around the corner. I can work. I can eat. I can pay yeah. my bills. But how is the life I'm living now going to affect my hereafter? Once you answer that question, then fine. Then fine. 
mm. you know? Mm. It, and, and that's how it hit me. It was like, boy. Yeah. Because like I could have, you know, I was doing all right while I was here. But mm. it was that question, what happens if I do die here? How will I be raised up? Will I okay, I might be I might be arrogant enough to say to myself, well, when the angels come and ask me, who is your Lord? Who is the prophet? You know what I mean? I might be, I can, I can answer that. You know what I mean? Okay, the next question is, uh, so you were buried in Croydon Cemetery. Why are you here in Croydon Cemetery? You're a Muslim. Why are you not in wherever? And that's where the stuttering, and don't forget, we're going to be in, in, in the Balzac. Your mouth will be stitched open and your limb stitched shut and your limbs are the ones that's going to have to be able to talk in for you because the first thing... The first thing that's going to want to come out of your mouth is a lie because you know the situation you're in. So I want to make sure that your tongue and your mouth are sealed and your limbs are the ones that's going to bear witness for you. So I might want to make up an excuse of what well, the reason why I was buried in Croydon Cemetery was because um, I missed the ticket. But the truth of the matter was, the truth of the matter, which is what my limbs are going to testify and say is, I was all right here. Mm. Yeah. And that can happen to any of us, born Muslim, not born Muslim, revert or not. That's mm. the fact in reality. We we can't, like, like, Allah knows best, of course. Allah knows best, of course. But we can't turn around and say, well, we can't explain to our Lord. Well, Allah, you gave me the abundance. You gave me ni'mah. You gave me wealth. I was all right here. Why would I want to go move to Pakistan? <laughs> do, you know, we, do you know what I'm saying? That's because mm. thinking, well... Ya Rob, you gave me all this sustenance. You gave me wealth. You gave me a property. You gave me a house. You gave me a good job. You gave me a, 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 a good wife and plenty of children. So why would I want to move to Pakistan? You can't ask that question. Well, the answers are in the book, bro. Mm. The answers are in the book. The answers are in the sunnah. Yeah. And mashallah, that definitely kind of hits hits home because my assumption was that uh, as it was in my question that perhaps you suddenly became muslim and you're like you know what you know how like some people become muslim six months later they're like they've gone to saudi arabia or somewhere and like yeah. i thought it was that kind of situation but when yeah. you put it in this context that uh, you were muslim for 20 21 years yeah. before you kind of made the move i feel like it is a traditional belief no matter which uh faction of islam or whatever because um, one of the local masjids here, it's like a standard uh, <coughs> Indo-Pak kind of Brailvi mosque, right? Mm. And um, just last Juma, the Imam was talking about this. Uh, funnily enough, he was talking about um, how you should be buried amongst Muslims. The, I, I, I don't want to say there was a hadith he mentioned, but I think I, I think he did mention a hadith. Uh -huh. And then he was saying how our ulama have always said that once the need is over, you should try and uh, and our, you should try and make moves essentially. And I was just thinking out of that whole um, masala of people sat there, like they're gonna go back to their jobs, whatever. Like, how many people are gonna even dwell on it? You know what yeah. I mean? Even though no one can say like no one can otherize it no one can say oh people who have that belief they say make hijra you know what i mean like because this is their imam you know what i mean yeah, yeah, yeah. so it, it's there but then people just it's like you said it's all right here <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, so, yeah what like what okay you like he's probably i don't i don't know the brother but imagine a situation now where he's been the imam there for years and just out of you know the, the ulama have said that once the need is over, we should make so. Oh, I only came here for a need then. Yeah. What What was that need? <laughs> yeah, that's the thing because, because no matter where you, no matter where you are in the world, yeah, your risk is always going to be given to you. No matter where you are, whatever's been written for you, you're going to get it unless Allah changes His mind and says, "No, you're not going to get it. You're going to get it." Yeah? yeah. So, what was the need? Yeah. I mean, it's very easy to say. I'm not trying to trivialize people's life experiences or anything yeah. like that. Yeah. But if you break it down, this dean is simple, bro. It's 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 it, okay. It's like life. Life is it's like how can I say? Life is easy 
But understanding how easy it is is a difficult part. This mm. deen is easy, but understanding how easy this deen is is a difficult part. Mm. Because we as human beings, we want to make things difficult. We want to we want to conceptualize stuff. No, bro, as a Muslim, we belong in a certain part of the world. And if you're not in that certain part of the world, you have to make efforts to get there. And on top of that, Allah gives us reassurances that he's going to make it easy for us. Mm. Where is your shady parts? Where, where's the difficulty now? The only difficult part is the effort that you're going to make. Mm. That's, the, that's the thing. Okay, well, well, well I'm going to... I heard some of the excuses were amazing. Like, I'm the oldest of four and I've got two younger sisters and I have to stay here to get them married before I go. Or Damn, that's actually that's that's more. <laughs> that's do you know what I'm saying, bro? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> or um, or uh, was it? I uh, was another one. Was um, my parents are old, and I'm responsible for them. Okay, yeah, you are. Yeah, bring them with you. Well, they're yeah. not going to want to come. So whose problem is it now, then, bro? Yeah. Because you, because what you're doing is that can be argued. What what you're doing is Islamic duty. Yeah. To remove yourself from harm into somewhere that's safe, and you want to explain to your parents, mum, dad. In contrary to what we understand, this place ain't good. Let's go back to Pakistan or Bangladesh. I got you. But <coughs> you can you can live your last days where mum and Baba used to be. In the same village, whatever. I got you. You're gonna be sorted out. Your health is gonna be sorted out. I got you. Let's go. If they're talking about what, well, boy? This is all I've known. <laughs> <laughs> you know that, what I mean? It's that, like, um, they're uncomfortable questions. Yeah. But in reality, they're easy questions to answer because it's clear. Yeah, that's the thing. Like with a lot of topics, I feel like you know, if you're like we should be we just focused on islam and the rules then life mm. becomes very easy like even with like in pakistan you have certain cultural practices and whatnot right and it's like for someone who's embedded in that system they sometimes see it as like whoa this guy that like, you know if if like there's a question and you're like that's not in the dean like we're not yeah. doing that that's not for them it's like a massive shock but for you you don't have to go through any of that kind of um what's the word like <clears throat> confusion or anything because for you it's clear it's clear and it's like once you have that mindset another one i was thinking of I, I read actually before the interview about how some people say as long as you can practice it the dean then ah. you're you're doing a service by potentially attracting non-muslims to islam which is really, like one of the maqasid of the religion but then i was thinking like how much is the average unless you're in a position of like an imam or someone right how much is the average muslim doing uh, like advertising their Muslimhood, how much are they doing? Like they're living well, in their own I Muslim community. I read that community. question as well, actually, man. And the, the, some of the scholars have said they've defined, they've tried to define what practicing your Islam means. Yeah, some of them have gone down to the point where they've said, okay, well, I have to be, you have to be able to hear the Adhan to say that, to say that you're practicing. Yeah, you have to be able to enjoy the right and forbid the wrong to say that, you know what I mean, you're practicing your religion. You know what I'm saying? You have to be able to marry four wives in the place where you are to say that you're because these are all tenants of the deen. If mm. somebody else who has not who has no relation to you apart from being a human being, that's your only relationship to that person, they have the power to take away a tenant of our religion, and you don't have the power to put it back, then you're not practicing your religion, bro. So it, it no, there's extreme, well, I don't think that's personally the extreme, but some people would look at it as extreme and, and moderate, yeah? A moderate person would say, well, I can pray five times a day, I can fast, I can go to the masjid, I can do this, da, 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 da. Okay, if you believe, or if that individual believes that they can stand before their Lord and say, based upon what I understood here, the, pra the practicing of my religion means the basic, five pillars then that's between you and your lord there are other people that think no 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 when you when the question is asked or when the statement is made can you practice your religion it means practicing my religion apart from those 
things that those who have been rightly placed in authority over me, i.e. in this case, the, the Islamic government or the, the, the Muslim moderator or whatever, what he has deemed that we can't do that, we can't do this, we can't do that, we can't do this, because the practice of such a thing might cause oppression. In that case, he has a right to withdraw that thing. Only he has the right to withdraw and implement and all that kind of stuff. In that case, I am practicing my religion. But somebody else who's got no relation to you, i.e. in this case, a non-Muslim, has taken away certain tenets of our religion and said, well, we can't have the Adhan going off at 2.30 in the morning because it's going to wake up the non-Muslim residents. You weren't practicing your religion, bro. Mm. But, like, like, I mean, I, I think even in, uh, in, in, in the times of the revolution, afterwards, I think um, the government at the time, they, in certain areas, they stopped the Adhan from being um, mentioned after Fajr. But it's permissible for him to do that in certain situations. So in that case, that's fine. Because he's 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 the one that's legitimately been placed in authority over us, so he can do that. Mm. He has the right to do that. He's a Muslim, he's in control, he can do certain things like that. That's fine. But for Boris Johnson to turn around and say, no more Adhans in the mornings. But, mm. but we're still gonna allow the masses to be open. Okay, well, he's like he's allowing the masses to be open. You know, mm. but we can still go and pray. So therefore, we're practicing our religion. Yeah. yeah I don't know about that, bro. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't feel... know about that. Bro. <laughs> I feel like I want to close on this point about like optimize the whole thing about this whole project is like try and make your situation better for life as a Muslim, right? Part of that, maybe it's on a higher level. Like it's not if you think very like like we were saying the deen is simple, but it's definitely something I wanted to put out there as part of like the library of content that we'll have because no. it's like people need to strive towards that you know what I mean like set yourself up to be able to practice the deen in a better way you know what I mean yes. it's like part of optimizing your life and like improving getting closer to Allah and building your akhirah as well so Jazakallah khair. I, My um, pleasure, bro. I'm happy I could answer some of your questions. No, it was really, it was really uh, interesting. I love the way you speak. I love the kind of you have like an entertaining style as well. Jazakallah khair. And so um, I'll up, I'll upload this uh, within a week, I think, inshallah. And, okay. So um, optimize Muslim.com is that the name of your YouTube as well, or is it just a just a, just a no? Podcast? The the name's optimize Muslim on YouTube as well. Okay. Um, and um, I'll upload it there. And I might get the little uh, Instagram like clips and then I'll send them to um, you, you brothers. And then it's up to you if you want to use it or share it or whatever else, um, depending on like what's in there. So, um, yeah, Jazakallah Khair and um, Shukran for your time. Shukran, Barakallah Fikr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim.